Okay, actually, you know, I said if I'm going to go for two, why not three? So I'm going to have to go a little fast because I don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm going to do three instead of two. And really, the topic is, is the, the map from sensation to perception. And, and I think you'll see echoes of David's talk from this morning. How do we turn a, a sensation into a perception? I won't say anything more. I'll just go because I don't have time. I want to just say one more thing. It's kind of the luxury of a theorist to be able to talk about three different preparations. So how can we do that? The reason we can do that is because the experimentalists do all the work. And I want to acknowledge that. OK, so here's the worm team. Um, the, uh, Ifan and Christine did the experiments in the lab of Corey Bargman. Uh, the, the modeling and, and uh, analysis stuff was done by Saul Cato, who was a student of mine, but who also was uh, supervised also by Corey. OK, so here's the deal. Um, if you put a food source in the middle of a dish, worms will uh, attract, get attracted to it. They will chemo sense and, and move on a path towards the, uh, towards the food source quite efficiently. And one of the ways they do this is very much if you know how bacteria move towards food sources, it's the same idea. So they'll move in a straight line uh, as long as the gradient of the food uh, odor that they're, that they're sensing goes up. But if they sense it, that it's going down, they'll do one of these omega turns. That's what this guy's doing, and that's what this guy's doing. They do a turn that sends them off in a new random direction. So these are called pirouettes, but it's the same sort of run and tumble uh, scheme that bacteria use. Uh, and by this scheme, eventually, as you can see, they get to the middle. On the other hand, they also have another strategy and another thing that they can do. Here are paths of worms uh, that are much more, you know, smooth uh, cur curves. There's, there's no omega terms here that, well, there's one, I guess. But uh, more smooth curving. And when they do this, uh, they do something with their nose, or the front of the, of the worm at any rate, which is to wiggle rapidly at about one hertz back and forth. Um, you can think of it, I'm going to probably call it left and right, but worms uh, crawl on their side, so it's really dorsal and ventral, but let's call it left and right. So they'll wiggle back and forth like that, sensing the environment. And so as you might think, they're sensing, should I turn right, should I turn left? And, and they can do a more directed steering, what's called steering path, towards the goal. Wait, Larry, the exactly. Exactly, the point. And of course, this one's not available to bacteria. They're not big enough to wiggle around like that. OK, yes. And the time scales is exactly the issue. So uh, these uh, C. elegans, by the way, this is what this is. I guess I never said that. Uh, sense food odors, among other things, with a, with a neuron called AWC. Here it is. It sends a dendrite out to the front of the, the animal, senses the odors. And in the past, uh, before our, our work, it had always been studied in the following way. What you do is you uh, put the animal in the presence of some odor, in this case isoamyl alcohol, uh, and then remove it. And these cells have an, what's uh, called an off response. So they respond to the removal of this odor. This is a fluorescence image. So these are our uh, G-CAMP images, everything I'm going to show. Uh, sensing of the calcium level in these neurons. These neurons do not fire sodium action potentials. So calcium imaging is actually not a bad way to monitor um, their activity. And what you see in response to the removal of odors is activation of the cell that decays away in about 30 seconds or something. And that in the past was thought to activate a search for new food. So the idea is the animal eats everything in its environment, uh, senses that it's gone, and this activates a motor program that will set off the search for a new uh, food source. And what it always looked like, uh, I was involved with, with uh, Saul also on some earlier work from Corey's lab, that this sort of decays to nothing, and there's just kind of some noise out here. So it's a fairly noisy response, a slow response, uh, and that was it. But uh, what Saul wanted to do was to apply more temporal dynamics methods to these animals. And that was made possible by a development of uh, Dirk Albrecht in Corey's lab uh, that allowed a rapid switching of odors in, in a liquid medium 
uh, to, the, to the worm. So here the worm is in a trap. It's stuck in a, in a little uh, tube there. And then through this micro, micro, microfluidics, you can flip between an odor stream and a clear stream very rapidly. Uh, and so deliver uh, odors with a, time, a more you know, temporal structure than just those steps that, that we did before. And when you do that, if you just do a periodic flip, 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 one way and the other, what you find is even in this period where you thought maybe the cell had just adapted away, it's really still quite sensitive to these more rapid oscillations in the odor. And that opens the idea of doing these kind of reverse correlation systems identification methods that are done in visual science all the time. In fact, essentially in everything, uh, but it had not been applied to the worm. And to do that, what you do is instead of a periodic stimulus like this, you give a pseudo-random stimulus, an M sequence. So here's the response uh, of this uh, AWC cell uh, to a, uh, a, a withdrawal of the odor and then a random sequence. What you can see those, those red pulses are, are when the odor is there and the white is when it's not. Um, and you, know, you see a, a response like that. Now, before, uh, this is actually a, a quite a smooth trace. We had always thought of this as fairly noisy neuron. But if you take uh, and look at responses, these all show two trials on five different worms to the same random sequence. Obviously, it's not a random sequence, the same pseudo-random sequence. Uh, you get a remarkably repeatable pattern uh, from animal to animal and from trial to trial. So this suggests you know, there's a, there's a little more deterministic uh, model here. And so what we decided to do, or really what motivated this in the first place, is one of these standard uh, a linear, nonlinear models uh, in in um, visual physics, uh, uh, visual applications. It's also often linear, nonlinear Poisson, but there's no Poisson here because these guys don't fire uh, action potentials. So we just fit a linear, nonlinear model to try to go from the concentration of the odor, uh, which we could get from from uh, dye imaging, to the response of this neuron, which is the fluorescence signal that you get from the GCAM. Um, so you pull out a filter, a temporal filter, and uh, it looks pretty much standard. Uh, it, it's going down here by the convention because this is an off-type cell. Uh, it, 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 it has its peak here at about a second and then decays away. So we got a filter and we got a nonlinearity, which looked kind of like a power law. Now, this, although this, this uh, going from here to the response includes, of course, the GCAM. This is both the response of the neuron, but convolved with the properties of the GCAMP indicator that allows the fluorescence to be measured. And fortunately, GCAMP has been very well characterized, so we could do th two things. One is we could just notice that this nonlinearity matched exactly GCAMP. So as far as we could tell, this neur neuron was actually linear. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this curve tells you how the concentration of odor, let's say, two seconds ago, re affects the response now. So this is time into the past. Why have to be up to seconds. Oh, oh, yeah. This thing is arbitrarily normalized because it's only the, you know, when you go through the nonlinear, it doesn't matter what this normal. This may be, uh, I don't remember. Well, I guess we, we normalized it to a peak of one, yeah, but it's arbitrary. Okay, yeah. That's what that is. Gets insensitive. Yeah. Yeah, no, we were down in, I mean, in this range. As far as we could tell, this looked just like the GCAMP Hill coefficient. Yeah, no, I'm going to get to that. Okay, so, so we can actually, if we're talking about the neuron and not the GCAMP, we can just call it linear. Uh, and then the next thing we could do is that the, the time uh, uh, evolution of the, of the GCAMP is again characterized, and we could deconvolve it. And so that's this. And so this, th this red one is now supposed to be the cell, which you can see really is quite fast, at least for a worm, uh, that, that it peaks in well under a second. And, and supports these, you know, that, that was the idea. Does this now support the faster behavior of this wiggling? Okay, so uh, the next trick that, that uh, the C. elegans community loves is finding a mutant. Uh, 
So this is now the raw filter. It isn't the corrected filter. But this is the wild type filter that I showed you. Peaks at a second. If I had deconvolved it, it would be down sub-second. And uh, sure enough, through the magic of, uh, of the Cory's kingdom, um, the, they found a mutant that can still detect odors. I'll show you that in a second. Um, but just had a slower filter. So you can see here that uh, in the raw filter, what was a one-second filter became something like a two-second filter. And that's really interesting because I mentioned that the wiggles of the worm's head as it's sensing the environment are about a hertz. So what we were hoping is that this would pull uh, this out of its natural operating range. And this is really active sensing, as David was talking about this morning. The, the worm is doing active sensing in the environment, but we have screwed up here the, the relation in the timing of its sensation relative to its motor actions. So the question is, do we see the effect? OK, well, so first of all, just to show that these worms can, in the slow time scale, can sense fine, if you look at their behavior during this run and tumble type search, uh, you don't see any effect. They look completely normal when they're doing this activity. So they can smell fine. Uh, the, the, the idea is that uh, the temporal structure, so when they do this, maybe they're, they're going to be fouled up. So remember, as I, I already said this, but they're wiggling their heads back and forth at about a hertz. And uh, a little analysis now, we'll, 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 I, can, I can derive for you what, what you think, what you ought to think that these worms are going to do. So here's the idea. A worm is, uh, let's say, going, the order gradient is straight up here. Or, or, you know, the, the, the worm wants to go straight up the board. And, and if it wiggles like this back and forth, what it's going to sense if it's going straight up is that the, the uh, concentration on both sides of its wiggle is the same, right? So it'll get uh, uh, no difference between the two sides uh, if, it's, if it's doing this. Now, if it's going at an angle, on the other hand, there, the two things will happen. One is uh, that when it goes like this, it'll get a different concentration on the two sides, so it'll sense a difference. And the other, of course, is that it should know that when, if the concentration is high on that way, I should turn that way. So there's an amplitude signal as it oscillates here, high, low, high, low. And then there's also a phasic signal of saying, ah, every time I, I turn upward like that, it gets higher, therefore I'll turn that way. Now, if you do a little analysis, uh, the, 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 ampli the, the signal that it gets from the two sides goes like a sine of the angle. In other words, it's zero if, the, if it's straight up, and it's a maximum if you're 90 degrees. And so you would expect that the, that the worm would respond to a turning signal that goes like the sine of its uh, angle to the gradient. Uh, OK, but remember, we got this slow mutant. And you know, the idea here is when the worm is going like this, it's going to get confused about which one's the left and which one's the right. And actually, we did some simulations with the model to show that when it moves its head thing, this produces a significant phase shift. So it's going to get confused. Was the high on my left side or on my right side? And so again, if you do a little math, you say, well, let's have a conjecture that the mutant worm is not going to be able to figure out. It's going to know, let's say, when it's heading this way, that the concentrations don't match. But it's not going to be able to figure out left from right. Uh, it, it, it will only be able to use, in other words, the magnitude of the, of the difference. But the phase will be lost because it's out of phase. So the conjecture is that the worm is going to sense this sine squared signal, the amplitude, and do a gradient descent on it somehow. Um, and so if you, if you take a, 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 this derivative, what you find is you get a sine of 2 theta. So the, I, there's a very simple prediction here that a wild type worm ought to respond uh, to its angle of deviation like a sine. But the mutant worm should do it like a sine of 2 theta, if indeed this active sensing is fouled up. Yeah? Is that just for, for the mutants that we can detect? Because the gradients are very weak in the side. I mean, I'll show you that they can do it. I don't know the numbers. Yeah, I mean, what, I mean, they set up a, a gradient in a dish. It's probably bigger than what they see in nature. But um, you'll see that they're going to do it. They do it. Yeah. They I don't know the number, though, no. Yeah, 
Well, they could, but they don't. Th this is under the assumption that they don't. So in other words, it, they're, they're not smart enough to do it, that they have this motor program, they have a sensory program, when they mismatch, you know, they just mismatch. Because as you'll see, okay, so the prediction here would be that you'd get a sign, I've only done it because the experiment was only done, that, that were folded over, uh, you'd get a sign uh, prediction for, for the response or sign to theta, and that really is exactly what you get. So here's the worm behavior measured as, it's called curving rate, it's really just the, the mean curvature of the path of the worm. Um, and indeed, the wild type looks pretty much like a sign, and, the, and this mutant uh, looks like it's, it's doing a sign of two theta. So, so this is a nice, you know, it's a nice example of the kind of active sensing that, that um, David talked about, that Dima's going to talk about, but it's a case where you can break it in a very nice way and really see that, and, and, and fortunately the animal's too dumb to fix it, I guess that's the other good thing. Uh, and so you can really see that uh, you need this match between motor action and sensation if you're going to turn the right way in life. Okay, next. Unless, any questions? Okay, this is the fish team. Um, the, yeah. You want to go back? No, what we're saying, it measures the difference. It knows, the, it, it measures the difference between left and right. Well, right? What would be the strategy if it had the same problem with the, with the model? What it is doing is not measuring the difference between left and right. Okay? Yes, it is. It is. It's measuring the difference between left and right. It just doesn't know which one's left and which one's right. It's still using that difference signal, right? Because you know if you're going straight up, the two should match. So you know you're going the right way if you get... Well, yeah, I mean, I was doing a gradient. I'm, I'm assuming they're doing, I don't know how they do the gradient, but I was assuming they're doing a gradient on that signal. That they're just looking for the path that minimizes that. Okay, I got two more animals to go, come on. All right, uh, so here's the, here's the team. Uh, these are all theory uh, graduate students. Uh, uh, Greg has now graduated and moved on to greater glory. Um, and uh, Nate, uh, uh, Karina was a, a tech in Nate's lab, but Nate is really the hero, as you'll see. These are really heroic experiments of this thing, uh, of this fish. Okay, so electric fish. This is a momyrid electric fish. It senses things uh, in two ways. One, I, w I wish, you know, I really wish Yossi was here, because I'm both mentioning the cerebellum and electrosensation, uh, and, and I want credit for that from Yossi. Okay, so... Uh, there's a passive system in this fish, which is just like the shark, which is what Yossi studies. Uh, and those are very sensitive electroreceptors that detect the electric fields caused by wiggling bugs and worms in the, in the environment and can passively detect them and, and, and guide the fish towards eating. This funny nose, this is called an elephant nose fish, uh, is, is all full of uh, electroreceptors. Uh, okay, but unlike a shark, this fish also has an active system. So it can make a shock in the water through the electric organ. Uh, it's a weakly electric fish, doesn't kill anything. Um, and then it can detect the electric field caused by that, that shock, uh, which is a very brief pulse. So this is an electric fish that is a pulsatile electric fish. Uh, and sense it by an active system and detect changes in the environment in the capacity and the resistance of, of, the, of the environment. So it has these two different systems, but I'm going to talk about the passive system. And the reason that this is interesting uh, and, and has been the subject of work for at least 30 years is because these two systems interfere with each other. As you might imagine, when the fish on its own body makes a very strong discharge of an electric field, it sends these guys into outer space because they're very, very low field detectors. And in fact, if you look at these um, passive electro uh, uh, receptors, uh, right after EOD stands for electric organ discharge, you'll see it all through. So at this time that the, the, the uh, fish activated the tail, you get this big ringing that lasts for about 200 milliseconds. And the fish does these at about uh, 10 hertz or so. So basically you'd see nothing but this if you didn't cancel it out. So the system I'm going to talk about is a system to cancel out this predictable effect of your own activity, 
uh, and sense on here a little bump that comes from the bug. That's the idea. So we're going to try to cancel this ringing signal. Um, this is a, a, a corollary discharge signal because this thing is actually a muscle. It's an adaptation of a muscle. And so the signal that the brain sends down to this thing is very much like a motor signal. And you can think of this system as very similar to the kind of system that I do as I walk around uh, and I, I, I adjust my vision so I don't think the whole room is swaying back and forth. I know that it's my own body that caused that, that motion and not an earthquake. Same kind of system. Uh, and so it's really the model system for this. And the work I'm going to talk about, what, what Nate really did was put the icing on a cake that was really baked by Curtis Bell. So uh, uh, the, the, um, it's a beautiful you know, 30 years worth of work. And the theory work that we did is kind of the icing on the cake uh, made by Patrick Roberts, who did very beautiful models. But as you see, there was one missing piece, which Nate filled in. All right, so, so in fact, here I can tell you all of the, the things that Curtis Bell did. So the idea is there is a cell called the MG cell. It's in a cerebellar-like structure in the uh, electrosensory lobe of the fish. And its job is to cancel out uh, these unwanted signals. So the idea is there's a sensory signal here that's totally predictable uh, and not interesting as a result of that. And, if, and that comes into these MG cells, and if that was the whole story, the MG cell would, of course, just respond to that signal. And that's not what you want. Instead, you want the MG cell, in a case like this, to just stay flat. I've got to really get moving. Um, OK, so the idea is that these guys uh, are going to generate the, what's called a negative image. They are going to generate, because they get a corollary discharge signal, a negative image of this. Um, of this, those two are going to add up and make the flat thing. So this is called a negative image. And you can see it because you can block this. And then you see this one. So it actually can be detected. Um, and uh, the other thing Curtis Bell and collaborators found is that there's a plasticity rule on these synapses, which is an anti-spike timing dependent plasticity rule coupled by a presynaptic only rule so that every time one of these guys fires, the synapse gets a tiny bit stronger. And if that firing is, is, uh, is com com combined by an MG cell response, what's called a broad spike response, uh, then the synapse gets weaker. So all of the pieces were put together here. It's kind of an amazing system. You know this input. You know what the system's supposed to do. You have the plasticity rule. The sad part is that this was completely unknown. And that's the part that, that uh, Nate and, and, and company filled in, is to figure out what are these inputs? How do they form a basis? from which you can construct the negative image. All right? Uh, so what Nate did, as I said, was really heroic. Uh, he, he um, let me go back here. These guys are granule cells. They form parallel fiber systems. So this is like a Purkinje cell. Uh, they form a parallel fiber system. There's no climbing fiber. Instead, there's this sensory input that comes into this guy. Um, and so he, first of all, he recorded uh, from the granule cells. Uh, then intracellularly, uh, he recorded from Golgi cells, which are inhibitory cells in this thing. He co uh, recorded from unipolar brush cells uh, that um, you know I'd never heard of, but they're the heroes of the story actually, which are another uh, cell in this circuit. And he, he he recorded from the fibers that form the inputs. These mossy fibers are the inputs to the granule cells, and then the granule cells. So the, this is our MG cell. Here's the parallel fibers. So we recorded from everything that could possibly make an input to this cell, basically. OK, so here's what the, uh, um, the granule cells look like. So these are, this is intracellular recording. So you're looking at membrane flu uh, potential fluctuations normalized. Most of them are boring. So here's the time of the electric discharge. And the issue here is that we're trying to get a signal out to 200 milliseconds as a basis from which to form negative images. So most of the cells just fire immediately. Uh, some of them have a little bit of a tail. Some of them kind of are inverse. They're tonically firing, and they're interrupted. And then they go back to tonic firing. And then these guys have a little bit of structure. But the bad news is, is only a small fraction of these guys fire. Um, and that when they fire, they fire one or two spikes. So this whole thing is really a small number of spikes. And when I saw this, I, just, I, I was about ready to give up this project. I couldn't see how we were possibly uh, going to do it. Uh, okay, so this is experimental data. If you look at the inputs, 
Uh, they look very much the same. They're these short guys. They are somewhat longer guys, and they're these sort of inverted guys. Um, for those of you uh, who, who know cerebellum, uh, all of these guys are due to the unipolar brush cells. Everything that we need, all the stuff that's happening at late times uh, is, is due to the unipolar brush cells. Um, this gap here is due to the Golgi cells. So anyway, I'm, I'm just sort of bragging for Nate. So the idea is that Nate uh, measured from 170 granule cells, but there are 20,000 inputs to these guys. And, and that's the key. If you looked at these 170, you'd say there's no way you could possibly make this signal. But there are 20,000 of them, and Nate was felt, had the, the dilemma that he could either uh, record from uh, 18,030 cells, or he could call in the theorists. So he called in the theorists, and we built models of these cells. And we did it in the following way. So granule cells have about three or four inputs. They come in the form of claws. If I have time, you'll see why I'm showing you this. Uh, and what uh, us, the, the theory gang did is to, to take one of um, his recordings from a granule cell. So here it is, intracellular recording. And then take all of the input, the mossy fiber inputs that he had on file, and using a sort of a sparse fitting algorithm, find the set that when you stuck them through a synapse and, and integrated them, this was just a passive model cell, uh, could reproduce this trace. So here's an example. If you take these inputs, uh, send them through our synapses and our, and our membrane potential, you get a pretty good model. This is quite amazing because these inputs were not recorded at the same time or even in the same fish as this output. But there's a big enough collection so we could do this. So we could do it for many cells. Here's examples. Um, these inputs are divided, I should have said this earlier when I showed you, into early, medium, and late varieties, uh, depending on when the input fired. Um, anyway, we could fit all of the cells in his data set quite well. And what we got then was a histogram of um, how many early inputs these cells got on average, how many mean, you know, here's a histogram of, of that. Now the conjecture then is that other than this histogram, the wiring is totally random. In other words, if we just built a whole bunch of cells randomly drawing uh, from this thing, these are the ones I showed you, by the way, this is just a tonic input that we included as well, that just by randomly choosing from these inputs and gluing them together, we could generate fake granule cells uh, that look like the data. And this is from a huge collection of fake granule cells randomly selecting 170 of them, just the way that Nate randomly selected cells to record, and this is what they look like, and this is what the data looks like. And I, I want to stress, this is not a fit to this. These are just randomly made and randomly selected cells. So it, it works rem remarkably well, which I would argue is a pretty good evidence that these things really are randomly wired, uh, other than that bias. Um, and now we can ask the question, does this whole thing work? So as I said, uh, three of the key pieces were put together by Curtis Bell and collaborators. We now have the last piece, and I'll just say quickly because I don't have much time, it works like a champ. So here is an, an image that comes into the fish uh, as an initial perturbation. Uh, you let the learning rule do its thing. After about 200 trials, it's completely gone. And that's, exa that's exactly what it takes the fish. It takes the fish a few minutes uh, to be able to cancel out a field. What you can do with the fish is you can perturb its own field uh, by putting on a, a field in the water and, and then coupling it to the pulse. So it gets c confused. It thinks it's creating that field, and you can watch it cancel out. So you can do exactly this experiment in the fish, and it works exactly the same. So this system works beautifully. Um, what we could show is that the basis that it used is particularly good. Here's the, the sort of learning curve as the error as you cancel out an unwanted signal over about 1,000 trials. And here's what you get from signals that we made with the exact same power spectrum but just scrambled up. So this basis is specialized to do what it actually has to do. Um, there was a little uh, puzzle in the community about if you try to make an, a negative image that's just a dip here, this is the experimental data, you always get this positive thing too, which you didn't want. That turns out to be explained by the, the basis. So I, I, I would just say, this is a beautiful system. Again, I can brag because I did so little, um, where, uh, where I think we really have a complete story in, in uh, neuroscience. Now, it's not the complete story of what the fish does. The fish does 
amazing additional things. But it, it's a nice, complete story. And, and really, Curtis Bell should be getting all sorts of prizes for this. I don't quite know why he isn't. Uh, OK, now I'll do quickly. I, I, I promise I can quickly do the fly. Here's the fly team. Um, the fly, basically, all I want to do is say the fly. The fly has exactly the same system. It, it uses it for a different purpose, but it's the same system. So here are uh, receptor signals coming in from the fly's exterior into a structure called the antennal lobe. They make, they make contact with glomeruli within the antennal lobe. There are not then projection neurons that pick up the signal from the antennal lobe and send it up to two structures. But the one I want to talk about is the mushroom body. Uh, within the mushroom body, uh, they make connections here to a set of cells called Kenyan cells. Uh, those are the analog of the granule cells. So this is a cerebellar-like structure as well. Uh, the axons of the Kenyan cells form parallel fibers in a number of different lobes of the, end of the mushroom body. That's what these are. But these are parallel fiber systems. And then output neurons, which are like the um, Purkinje-like cells, cut across in different zones. So there's an output neuron for, for different zones. Not this one. That's, that's the peduncle, but this. Um, uh, th for different zones of these things, slice through and get the inputs. And instead of a climbing fiber, uh, they get a dopamine input. But it's a sp in spirit like a climbing fiber. And what I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly show. So this structure is very much like one of these cerebellar structures, very much like the structure we studied in the fish. Um, if you look in here, what you find, I'm going to do this quickly, is that these Kenyan cells have a number of claws. I hope you can see it. There's a claw here, just like these cells. Instead of about four, they have about seven. But again, a very small number of claws. Uh, we showed through experiments I won't, I won't describe here, we could actually get a connection matrix between the glomeruli in the mushroom body, in, in the antennal lobe, and the Kenyan cells in the mushroom body. We could do exactly the same thing as we did with the electric fish. In this case, there were these five different types of input. In this case, there are 50 different types of input because of all the different glomeruli, but we could get a histogram of the frequency of those, exactly the same with this. And then we showed, I'm not going to go through this because I'm out of time, uh, that this is all you need to know. That other than this, uh, this preference for certain glomeruli, the same thing that where this has preference for early inputs, if you construct cells from this distribution, otherwise just randomly choosing the same as this, uh, you, you can fit the data. So both of these systems look like they have random connections. Um, and I will just, I'm just going to get to that. I'm going to get to it by analogy. All right. So here's my picture of the, elect uh, of the electrosensory lobe. So now let me turn it into the mushroom body. OK? So I just have to rename it. Same circuit. Um, the, the MG cell, or this Purkinje-like output cell, is now what, what we call the mushroom body output neuron. There are only about 30 of these that carry the, the signal from the mushroom body to the, the rest of the animal. I should say, I should say a little bit that uh, the mushroom body is really for olfactory learning, but we'll get to that. And then I'll stop. Okay? Um, this guy is a, called a Kenyan cell instead of a granule cell, but it still makes the, that thing. Instead of the EOD command, what you get here is the olfactory input. So remember, this is, this is kind of a, of a different thing. This, the sensory input in the electric fish was this guy. This is the input you're trying to predict. And, and this was the, the corollary discharge. Here, the olfactory input is actually the, the structure from which you're making the prediction. And this guy, instead of a, a sensory input, is a dopamine input. And instead of driving the cell, what it does is modulate plasticity. But if you draw the analogy here, then what you have to say is that this system is there to predict the dopamine response. And that's in the sense of, of a learning system. In other words, you, you have a certain olfactory environment. You have a great time. You get a lot of do the certain kind of dopamine input. What you want to be able to do is predict that the next time you're in that olfactory environment, you'll be able to predict. This is a great space because I can predict that the last time I was here, I got a, a dopamine input. Obviously, the same with negative things. So we're, we're currently modeling this system. And, and for me, at least, I don't know if it did any the fly people any good, but this understanding of this thing as, as a sort of these, a cerebral-like structure that's trying to predict this, it really 
help me at least tr figure out what we're doing. And so now we're trying to figure out if similar plasticity rules, which have been measured in locusts but not in flies, uh, dopamine modulated, can, can derive this prediction in exactly the same way as what I just showed you. So I'll just end with the lessons. Uh, you can read them, but um, I think all of these systems add you a little bit about what you have to add to sensation to get to perception. Okay, I'll stop there. So. Which, sorry, the, which the filter that actually tracks the speed of that uh, odor of candy. Yeah. So is, 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 the filter's running faster in the wild type, but slower in the mutant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that, I, I don't know, I just wonder, but I think, so it's, I guess it's something like a common filter going on there, and then it's probably just. The it's even, yeah, it's, just, it's simple. It's just a linear filter, really. It's yeah. just a low pass filter kind of thing. Band pass filter, I guess, yeah. Right, right. So once the signal is getting larger, it gets so large that the specificity can't see it, which is also the most that the filter will take on the input. Exactly. And then it cancels the postsynaptic response. So how does the preprint mechanism get to the structure? Otherwise, you don't have the structure of a negative So what happens is, is you get a little bit of strengthening with each <laughs> presynaptic pulse and then a weakening, a big weakening with every one. So you get it down to the point where the postsynaptic cell fires very rarely. It doesn't fire never but it's down to a low enough level that it essentially it's zero. So it, it's actually self-regulating. We ran these simulations on and on and on, and it's stable. It doesn't, it doesn't, you don't need to stop it. That's right, in the model, you just don't need to stop it. It'll just stay there forever. With a, you know, there's a slight wobble because every once in a while there's a corrective uh, synaptic depression, but you don't have to stop the plasticity. Yes, yes, one's basal, one's... But again, it, this, this is where these learning rules are very clever. It, it will adjust it to compensate for whatever dendritic loss you get. So it, it takes care of itself. So, yeah, that's a great question because clearly it's there, right? You might have thought that the mutant would just be completely lost. There's a backup system. I don't know. I mean, it must. It must use it, right? Or it, would have gone, it wouldn't be there. But that, that's a great question. Can you think of a case where you would want it? And not, I, I don't know. It could be that as you're getting close, it's better to use that one uh, than the other one, you know? So you switch over as you get close, something like that. But I've never done the noise analysis to it. If it's a noisy enough environment, maybe it's better to go back to the other one. That's why I skipped, you know, thank goodness my, co my experimental collaborators aren't here. It's a really heroic process. Uh, do, can I have, do I have time to just stop me if I have to? But okay, what you do is you take. You, you express a photoactivatable GFP in all the Kenyan cells, and then you photoactivate one of them. So that's what this is. That's why you can see this one. These are all the other Kenyan cells, but you can see this one guy, right? Now, these claws, which I showed, are, have, are, are very tightly packed microglomeruli, basically. So what they do is to fill with a dye, fill the claw, and the, the projection neuron takes that up. So here's the axon of the projection neuron. Always one projection neuron gets filled this way. Here are the other terminals of that projection neuron. But then you can go back to the antenna lobe. And there is where it gets its uh, excitation from. And then if you have a map of the, these are the different glomeruli. If you have a map, you, then you know which glomerulus this is when you do have a map. So that's how it's done. 
you know, done 200 times. So um, one of the areas of interest in, uh, in uh, my group is how neural noise, neural stochasticity within neural networks affects their dynamics. And I'm going to tell you about some aspects of these, these questions in relation to uh, neural networks that maintain short-term memory. Um, part of this work was done in collaboration with Ila Fitt in UT Austin. And then I'll, I'll also tell you about some more recent work, which is done by two students in my lab, Ishai Mo and uh, Imhot Shacham. Okay, so here are the assumptions that I'm going to make. You can argue with both of them, but this is what we'll do today. I'm going to assume that, uh, that single neurons have a short memory in the, in the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds coming from the dynamics of the synaptic currents, from the dynamics of the membrane potential, no longer than that. And I'm going to assume that short-term memory does not involve any synaptic modification. I'm going to focus on uh, networks that maintain short-term memory through persistent activity and that represent and maintain memory of continuous variables. What do I mean by that? You can imagine, for example, that I'm showing you uh, a bar. So if this is working. I'm showing you an oriented bar. Then I remove it. And after a while, I'll show you another bar, and I ask you whether the second bar is rotated clockwise or anticlockwise relative to the first bar. So to perform this task, you need to represent in your brain a memory of the orientation of the bar. Now, in this visual uh, sensory context, it's actually not very well known how the memory is stored in the brain. But there are other brain areas that represent continuous variables where a lot is known about at least the coding properties of the neurons in areas that are thought to maintain the short-term memory. A good example is the oculomotor system, where neurons provide tonic con continuous firing to the muscles in order to maintain the eye in a particular position between saccades. So this is maintained for a few hundred milliseconds. And other nice examples come from sp spatial representation in rodents and in other animals. For example, the head direction system, in which cells are tuned to the orientation of the head relative to the environment. But they maintain this representation even if we remove the sensory inputs, so the system somehow maintains uh, memory. It has more recently been uh, proposed that grid cells, which fire as a position of the animal's location in the environment with a very interesting uh, hexagonal pattern, that these grid cells also, among other computations, through network dynamics, maintain short-term memory of the animal's position. So the kinds of questions that uh, I'll be interested in is, are how does noise affect short-term memory of continuous variables, how this depends on various properties of the, of the single neurons, this, like the, 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 the synaptic time constant, the network, the connectivity of the network, the number of neurons. I'll argue that there's a relationship between the performance of the network in the presence of noise to coding properties of the network. And in the end, I'll also touch on a question related to the source of the noise in these kinds of networks. Okay, so just to set the stage, here's a, uh, an example for a model which is used to, a model for the head direction system in rodents. We imagine that we have a neurons which are arranged on a ring, so we associate an angle to each neuron, which is actually its preferred angle uh, for, for the head uh, orientation. And we imagine that these neurons are connected to each other through weights that depend on the difference in, the, on the, uh, in, their, label, in their labels, in their angles. And the, and the dependence look like this. So neurons that are close to each other uh, excite each other, and they inhibit the rest of the neurons. And then it turns out that in networks that have this kind of connectivity, quite broadly, you can get steady states that look like this. Um, a few of the neurons are firing. There's a bump of activity right here. They're inhibiting the rest of the neurons. But now, because of the rotational symmetry in this network, the bump can be anywhere on this ring. So there is a continuum of possible steady, possible steady states of this network. Okay? So now we can imagine how this network can perform uh, a shorter memory task. We can imagine that some inputs at time zero provide preferential excitation to some of these neurons. This sets the, this sets the position of the bump. But now if we remove the, the inputs, the bump will remain where it is because it's a steady state of the dynamics. And if the network was deterministic, if there was no noise, it, this bump would remain there indefinitely. And the question that we want to understand is how noise affects the position of the bump as a function of time. 
So the way we um, address this question theoretically is that we look at networks of so-called linear and nonlinear Poisson neurons. So our neurons are very simple. They sum up the synaptic inputs with the appropriate weights. They might have some also some feedforward excitation. All this goes through some nonlinearity, which might look like this. It might have some other structure. The synaptic output coming from the neuron J is a filtered version of the firing rate with a synaptic with a time constant, which is the synaptic time constant. This, and this is the intrinsic time, uh, time constant of memory of our neurons. And if I would if I would stop here, this would be the standard rate equations used to, to often to model neural networks. But what I'm going to do is I, I want to explicitly take into account the fact that the neurons are, sp are creating, generating spikes. So I'm going to replace this firing rate by a spike train. So the model now is that the neuron sums up its inputs. This, this, this determines its firing rate, and it's generating a Poisson spike train with that rate. And the Poisson firing, the variability of the Poisson firing, is the source of noise in this model. I should say also that um, I'm showing here the ring network just as a, as a model network that to think about, to keep in mind, but the discussion is really very general. The only thing that I'm going to assume is that the rate dynamics of the network has a continuum of steady states, okay? And I'm also, a technical but important point is that I'm going to consider networks where the dynamics is somehow close to the deterministic dynamics. The noise is, the noise is weak, it's a small perturbation, and one way to achieve that, for example, in the ring network would be to put in many neurons. So we can put in more and more neurons, scale the, the synaptic constant appropriately so the, the average input to a neuron will not depend on n. And in that case, as we put more and more neurons, the, we make the neurons more and more dense, the system becomes more and more deterministic. So I'll, I will loosely refer to this kind of limit as the large n limit. Okay, so now what, what happens in such a network? Before I show you some analytical results, here's a simulation. We, we simulate the ring network. In this case, we choose synaptic weights which are purely, which are purely inhibitory, but neurons don't inhibit their close-by neighbors. There's also feed-forward excitation, which is driving the network. And very quickly, as we simulate this, this network, it goes into one of the possible steady states. So the rate of the neurons as a function of the, the, the position of the neuron on this ring is shown here. Okay. But if we look at the spikes that were generated in the past 10 milliseconds, they're a noisy version of this firing rate. Some of the neurons fired one spike, some of them fired two spikes, some of them didn't fire at all. If we look at the dynamics of this network, what we see is that this bump is constantly fluctuating and it's also moving to the right and to the left. So the fluctuations, say, in the height of the bump are constantly being kept small. But since this network has a continuum of possible steady states, if the noise happens to move the bump to the right or to the left, there's no restoring force that's going to uh, return it to its original position. And therefore, not surprisingly, if we measure the variance of the motion of the bump as a function of time, we find that the variance is proportional to time. So this is a simple random walk. And the slope of this dependence defines the diffusion coefficient of this, of this random walk. So we really, really want to know how large the diffusion coefficient is and how it depends on the properties of the network and the single neurons. Yes? Yeah, so if we would provide input, then the, the input would, depending on the strength of the input, the input would keep the, the, the bump at a certain position, but we're now considering a case where we completely remove the, the sensory inputs and the network is doing its own thing without any, any sensory bias. Okay, so we can calculate this, this uh, for any network of you know, for some neurons, we can calculate this diffusion coefficient. I won't talk much about the expression that we get, but I want to point out two things. The diffusion coefficient is inversely proportional to the number of neurons, okay, in this scheme where we increase the number of neurons and scale down the weights, and it's also inversely proportional to the synaptic time constant, which makes sense. If you think about the statistics of motion, this means that the amount of motion that you move over a time t is actually proportional to t over tau. If you make the neuron, the single neurons, more persistent, you get more persistence of, more, more persistence of the bump. Okay, um, 
So there are many consequences coming from this, but I just want to highlight the, the, the most important one, and this is that the variance is proportional to time, to the, to, to the delay time from the presentation of the stimulus to the measurement. And here's an example where actually something like this is seen in behavior. So here monkeys were uh, trained to, to fixate on a, on a fixation point, and then on the periphery, at a certain eccentricity, they were shown another point in one of eight possible directions, and then they had to either saccade to that point immediately while that point was being shown, this is this case, or the point was removed and they had to that saccade to the position of the point after a three second delay or a six second delay. I think you can see very clearly that the variance of the saccade increases as a function of time. On the other hand, for example, in the uh, oriented bar task that I, I mentioned earlier, uh, where I show you a bar and then I remove it, Human subjects seems to have very little dependence of their variance on the, on the delay time. And I'm not going to try to explain these differences, but if we seriously think that the memory is stored in something like, like a continuous attractor network, this is a question that we should ask ourselves. What, what is the source of the difference between these different cases? Yes. That's right. So you're saying that there maybe there's a broader class of models where you would have a variance that increases as a function of time. Okay. My point is that for a continuous attractor network with noise, we expect to have a, a random walk. Okay. I'm not. This does not exclude other models. Yes. Uh, Well, this depends. This we're getting into very minute details of the of the of the task, with, but this depends on whether the monkey has somehow learned that there is a particular distance that, that the monkey has to to saccade to. Maybe this is a two-dimensional, two-dimensional random walk. Okay. Okay. Another um, point that I'd like to make is that it, is that it turns out that in addition to induce, introducing a random diffusion, noise in these networks can also introduce systematic diffusion. And I'll show you, an, and here's an example where this happens. So the idea is the following. We take the ring network that I described before. Now, the, the magnitude of the diffusion coefficient depends on the d density of the neurons, the number of neurons in, on the ring. And it's smaller if the density is higher. So we can construct a network where the density of neurons depends on the position of the ring. We scale the synaptic, we downscale the synaptic weights based on the density at the area of the presynaptic input so that the inputs to a given neuron will be the same as if the density was uniform. And in that case, we can get a network whose deterministic dynamics is exactly the same as if the density of neurons was uniform, but the stochastic dynamics is not the same. For example, the diffusion coefficient is larger if the bump is around here uh, compared to a bump which is here. And now in such a network, if we put the, the, the network, the bump in different initial positions, which you see here, and we then run the dynamics over a few seconds, and we average this over many, many trials, and we look at the average trajectories starting from different positions, you can clearly see that there's a bias uh, towards different directions, okay? And in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's, it can be quite significant. So. Um, we can calculate, in similarity to the fact we can calculate the diffusion co coefficient, we can also calculate the, 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 the systematic drift, compare it to simulations. Um, I will not say much more about this. I will just mention that there is an intriguing, interesting analogy between the situation and the, and the physical system, which is a particle, say, diffusing in a gradient of temperature. So for, the, for this particle, there is no driving potential that is moving it that, it wants, that makes it want to move to the right or to the left, but we know that there's convection in such a situation. Particles tend to go from the high temperature area to the low temperature area. And in both these cases, the neural case and in this case, this motion is driven by, th by fluctuations. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, in similarity to the, to the physical system, it turns out that if we look at the drift, which is shown here, it's proportional to another quantity, which is a derivative of the diffusion coefficient with respect to the position along the ring. Um, and, uh, but the, the proportionality coefficient is of order one, but it's not the same in this system as in the thermal uh, uh, particle case.
Okay, the, the main point that I want to make about the systematic drift is, first of all, it vanishes in linear networks. You have to have a, a neural nonlinearity in order to get this drift. In similarity to the diffusion coefficient, it's of order one over n. In some sense, it's of lesser importance than the random diffusion when you think about loss of information, because the direct source for this loss of information is a random component of the motion. But nevertheless, the main reason I'm talking about this is that in models of attractor systems, for example, the ocular motor system, a lot of the discussion is about tuning of the network to avoid systematic drift. And the point that I want to, to convey is that once you acknowledge that the network is uh, stochastic, you have to take that into account when discussing the, the systematic uh, um, motion in the network. Okay, I'm going now back to um, random diffusion. And this whole random diffusion is a source, is, is, is a result of uh, stochasticity in the network. But when we think about uh, activity of neurons in a certain brain area, there is another aspect of the noise which we're, which we're much more uh, regular to think about, much more used to think about. And this is the effect of noise on coding. So what do I mean by that? Imagine that the bump here um, is not moving. It's still just ignore the, the diffusion for, for a moment. Now imagine that you're, th so the neurons in the network are firing as well in our model as Poisson spike generators with a rate that depends on the position of the bump. And now imagine that you observe the spikes generated by the network over a time scale delta t, okay? So because the neurons are, are noisy, there's, there's Poisson variability, there is a certain ambiguity about the position, the position of the bump that you can infer from the spikes. So this is a classical question of uh, coding or population coding in a neural network. If the neurons are Poisson, then we know that the variance of an estimator of the position of the bump based on the spikes is related to the Fisher information. For Poisson neurons, we can fi define a Fisher information rate. So the longer we observe the spikes, the better we can identify where the bump is based on these spikes, okay? Now, this is a coding aspect of the, of, the, of, the, of the network. And previously I talked about the different aspect of the noise, which is a diffusion. And we may ask whether there's any relationship between these two uh, aspects of the, of the effect of noise. And I'm going to argue that there should be such a relationship. And the argument goes as follows. Everything a neuron knows about what all the other neurons in the network are doing comes from the spikes which are emitted over the past synaptic time constant, 10 or 100 milliseconds. Okay? So in order to, for the network to maintain its own state, in order for each neuron to, do, to know what to do and to fire according to the correct position of the bump, the network essentially needs to estimate its own state, the position of the bump, based on the spikes emitted within a time, synaptic time constant. Okay? So if there is a certain limit to how well you can infer the position of the bump based on the spikes over a synaptic time constant, this is one over j tau, we expect that we, the network cannot be expected to maintain its position to any better accuracy than that, and therefore the diffusion of the, of the position of the bump has to be at least this quantity, and this is two times the diffusion coefficient times the synaptic time constant. Okay? So this is kind of a hand-waving argument, but this is something that we might expect, and it turns out that this is correct. We can prove that for any network, continuous attractive network of Poisson neurons in the large n limit, this inequality uh, um, has to be obeyed. And there are many interesting consequences uh, for that, but I'll just mention very broadly two of them. One of them is that this tells us that there is a deep relationship between efficient coding and maintenance of memory. In order for the network to maintain the memory it's preferential to have high information. We're used to think about coding as an aspect of the network activity as seen by an, ex by an external observer. But in order to maintain the memory, the network needs to observe its own state. And therefore, there's a, a deep relationship between these two aspects. And it, it's interesting and intriguing to think whether this principle goes beyond the continuous attractor networks that I talked with you about, that I'm talking with you about today. The other reason that this is interesting is that we often know a lot about the coding, property, co coding properties of neurons in particular brain areas. And if we can estimate the Fisher information based on these coding properties, this gives us a certain window through which we can learn something about the dynamics of the network, or at least the expected dynamics of the network uh, within, these, within this framework. Okay, the last uh, topic that I'm going to uh, talk about relates to a deep uh, question in many brain areas, and this is where, where is the noise coming from? 
we might imagine that, so in many bra in cortical brain areas, we know that neurons are firing in similarity to Poisson processes. They seem very, very variable, either exactly Poisson or similar to Poisson. And we might imagine that this comes from intrinsic, neural, intrinsic noise within the neuro, ne neurons, from stochasticity of the ion channels, from stochasticity of the synaptic transmission. But on the other hand, we know that when neurons in the cortex are, when we can control the input to a neuron and provide to it strong fluctuating input, um, neurons become very deterministic. So this suggests that perhaps the source of the noise is not intrinsic and one of the hypotheses that people have raised is that the noise is actually more similar to a bunch of particles running around in a, in a, in a container. The, the particles are described by deterministic dynamics and nevertheless their they collide with each other, and each other and the trajectories seem very random. So it has been shown by uh, uh, Carl van Brenswick and Chaim Sopolinsky and also by others that indeed model, model neural networks can behave in this way. You can put them in, in a state where the dynamics is deterministic, but the dynamics of single neurons seems very uh, stochastic and Poisson-like. And therefore this raises, now in our model, in the, in the, in the model that I discussed so, uh, before, the, the model with Poisson neurons, our neurons have intrinsic noise. What the, each neuron does it sums it, is that it sums its input, that sets its rate, but now it's firing intrinsically as a Poisson uh, process. But maybe that's completely wrong. Maybe the noise, the Poisson-like firing is coming from the network dynamics, and therefore this raises the question whether these two types of noise have similar effect. And what we want to do in order to uh, address this question is to construct networks that have two properties. One is that they have a continuous attractor, and the other is that they have chaotic balanced dynamics where the single neurons look Poisson. Okay, so there's probably more than one way to do this, but I'll tell you about uh, one approach that we've been looking at so far. Our philosophy is to look first at the most simple network that we can construct. And this is a kind of a story in progress, a work in progress, but I'll share with you uh, what we've learned so far. So um, here's the idea. Uh, here's the idea. I first need to tell you um, a little bit about a classical model of balanced networks and many people here are familiar with the, the model uh, by, uh, proposed by Carl von Brunswick and Chaim Sampolinski. Um, and then we're going to make a tweak on this model. So we're going to start by a med network which is not a memory network. It just has an excitatory population, an inhibitory population um, with connections in, within, within each population and between the populations. There are two parameters which are very important one of them is the size of each population, which I'm going to denote by n. And the other one is the average number of synapses that each neuron receives. So we imagine that neurons receive, choose randomly on average about k synapses uh, from, from each population. And, and so the, the, the connections are random, but on average there, there are k connections to each neuron. Uh, our neurons are going to be simple binary neurons which update asynchronously, so each neuron randomly decides when to, when to update itself at a rate which is tau k. This tau can be different for the two populations, but we're going to choose it to be about 10 milliseconds. So this is the intrinsic time constant of our neurons. And the update rule, whenever a neuron updates, the update rule is very simple. The neuron sums its inputs. If the sum is beyond the threshold, it goes into the, the on state. If, the, if it's below the threshold, it goes into the off state. Um, what else? Uh, the, it's very important in this case that we choose the connectivity in the way shown here. So we have a very large number of neurons. We have also a large number of synapses, maybe a thousand or a ten thousand, but k, the number of synapses is small compared to n, so there's little overlap between the, the inputs to different neurons. Finally, uh, talking about parameters, uh, it turns out that in this, in this network we can choose the, ex the weights coming out of the excitatory uh, networks arbitrarily without any loss of generality, so we just choose in a particular way. And then our parameters are the excitation, feed-forward excitation going here into the excitatory uh, population, and the strength of the synaptic weights going from the inhibitory population to itself, and from the inhibitory population to the excitatory population. You'll notice the scaling that I showed here, that, that is written here that everything is being scaled as a, as a function of k. When we increase k, it's scaled as 1 over square root of k. And roughly speaking, what happens in this network is that the strength, naively, the strength of input, the inputs to each neuron is large because it's k synapses times 1 over square root of k. Okay? 
but these networks dynamically go into a state where to leading order in K, the inputs to each neuron are zero. So they, inhib they, they, in they go into a state where the excitation and inhibition, inhibition balance themselves to leading order in K. The neurons fire similar with Poisson-like statistics, but be and because the condition that the input to leading order in K is zero, and because this condition, the inputs sum up linearly, this is very important to us. The response of this network is completely linear. Despite the fact that the, the individual units are nonlinear, the, the response is linear. If we increase the excitation to this, to this network and we follow the activity of the excitatory population or the inhibitory population, they're both linear, linear in the input in this limit. Okay, large number of neurons, much larger than the number of synapses, much larger than one. Okay, so here's the idea now that we, that we're, the network that we're looking at. We take two networks of this form Okay, and we connect them with inhibitory connections. Okay, so the, the inhibitory neurons in network one synapse into the excitatory neurons in, in network two and vice versa. And now let's to, to just understand what's going to happen. Let's imagine, let's imagine that we fix the activity of these neurons for a moment and ask what's going to happen here. So here the excitatory neurons are receiving an excitatory input minus something proportional to the activity of these neurons. And because the response of this network is linear, we expect a linear dependence on the, of the activity of these neurons as a function of the activity of these neurons. Okay, so this looks like this. But we can switch the roles of the two networks. Okay, and now you see that the two lines collide in one position, and this is going to be the state that the network will go into. Okay, so there's a single, we can expect to have a single steady state the dynamics. Now we can tune the inhibitory connections, okay, the, the connections between the two networks. We can start increasing them. And at a certain stage, these two lines will collide. Okay, and now we may expect to have a continuum of possible steady states of the network. Okay. So this is really very, very similar to the simple idea used to model, say, uh, decision-making circuits in the cortex, where you have linear populations of linear neurons that are inhibiting each other. But instead of having linear neurons, our, our network is compo composed of two balanced networks which are inhibiting each other. Now, this is just the idea, but it turns out that indeed if you analyze the dynamics of such a network, it's, pro uh, it's possible to prove that it has a continuum of stable steady state. So in, the, in this limit, the network will be happy to stay at any one of the positions along these lines. And if we will perturb it a little bit out of the line, it will flow back to the, to the, to the line. And this work is done by Nimrod Shacham. So this is true for a wide range of parameters, but it requires fine tuning of the connections between the, the populations. This is a general issue with most models of continuous attractor networks, that you need to fine tune the, the connections. Okay, but what we're really now interested in is what happens when these numbers, K and N, are finite, not when they're infinite. So let me first tell you what happens when the number of neurons is still infinite, but the number of synapses is finite. So in this case, the dynamics of the network can be uh, understood through the so-called mean field uh, equations. And it turns out that if we work out, in this case, the relationship between the activity of the two populations, I think here this is really showing the excitatory populations, but it doesn't really matter. If you look at the relationship between the M1 and M2 and M2 and N1, the network, each one of the balanced networks is not precisely linear anymore. So uh, it's, easy, it's difficult to see this here, but the, the curves, the red curve and the blue curve are not really, really, really linear. Okay, so strictly speaking, they meet each other at one point here and the network has just one stable state. Okay? This is, for, by the way, for k equal 1000. But on the other hand, you can see that the curves are almost overlapping. So we might expect the dynamics to be almost like the dynamics of a network with a continuum of steady states. There's another thing that happens when we look at finite k, and this is that we need to adjust the connections between the, the networks differently from what we would do if k was infinite. If k was infinite, we would need to choose one, the, the j equals 1.5. It turns out to be 1.7 in this case, but this is not really very important for us. So let me show you what happens in the dynamics. So here we take this network, we put it in this state, and follow the mean field equations, and it goes into this true steady state. But now if we introduce just a little bit of noise, and we're doing it artificially right now just to probe what the network wants to do, 
when we inject a little bit of noise into the dynamics, we see that the network is very happy to move around along this, along this continuum of almost steady states. Okay. Now comes the really interesting part, which is the part where we look at finite n, finite number of neurons and finite k. And now we don't know how to solve the mean field equations, but we can just simulate these networks. So here we see, look, you look at a simulation of 30,000 neurons, k is equal to 1,000. So it's 30,000 in each one of the populations. We have four populations. And when we look at the dynamics of the network, we see that it kind of moves around along this line of states. Okay. If we project throughout the simulation, if this is a particular simulation, if we project the, the state of the system along this diagonal line and follow its dynamics, we find that, it, that this variable that I'm going to call theta, the position along this line, kind of slowly fluctuate. And I'm saying that it's slow because the time scale here is seconds, okay? Now, you'll have to believe me, I don't have time to show the, the data, but you'll have to believe me that this trajectory can be well fitted by so-called Ornstein-Ullenbeck process, which is just a simple random walk with restoring force. And the other point that you'll have to believe me uh, about is that if you look at the firing of these neurons in this network, they, they kind of, they're kind of random and they look Poisson-like. Okay. So now we're in business. We have a network which has a continuum of steady states, and it has Poisson-like firing arising from a chaotic, uh, chaotic balanced state. And the, and the last question that I'd like to uh, discuss is whether this particular network that I've shown you here can be thought of as a reasonable memory network. I think by looking at this plot, you might also already have the answer, but let's look at it a little bit more carefully. So the dynamics of theta is described in an ornstein ullenbeck process. There is a restoring force, okay? And the restoring force is related to the tuning of the inhibition between the two networks. If the, inhibition, if the tuning would be perfect, this, pr this prefactor k would be zero, okay? And there's also random diffusion. Now, the parameter k, as I mentioned, it has to do with the tuning of the network. It has dimensions of one over time. And if we want the network to show persistent activity over a time scale of, say, one second, we better choose k to be at least as small as one over one second. So this is what we did here. We tuned the, the, the connections to, to have that value of k. We could tune it even better than that, but I should mention that we already had to fine-tune the, the j's, the, connection, the inhibitory connections between the two populations, up to uh, about 10 to the minus 4 relative accuracy. Okay, so this is this, the, the deterministic part of the dynamics, but there's also diffusion. Now, how, how, what is the length over which the state of the network diffuses over at the time scale set by k, one second, it's one of the square root of d over k. And in this case, it turns out to be 0.1. Okay, now what should we compare the 0.1 to? We should compare it to the full range of positions in which we could put the network initially. We want a position to represent a certain memory. So the range of values that we can choose for theta is about 0.5. So I would say that this network is a pretty lousy memory network because over the time scale of a second it randomly drifts a distance which is about a fifth of the full range that it can take. And so what can we do to improve it? One possibility would be to make d smaller. And let's say, let's be very conservative. Let's just want to make d smaller by a factor of 10 so that we'll get a gain of, of 3 in the dynamic range of the network. So um, if the noise correlations between the neurons in this network can be ignored, which is probably true, then we can expect the diffusion coefficient to go like 1 over n, as it does for a network of Poisson neurons, as I've shown you previously for Poisson neurons. And it turns out that this is true. Here you see simulations of networks with different network sizes, okay? And the measured diffusion coefficient falls beautifully on a 1 over n line, okay? So this means that one way to make d smaller by a factor of 10 would be to increase the number of neurons by a factor of 10. But this already puts us in a network with a huge number of neurons. We, have we had initially 30,000 neurons in each population, four populations, so it's 100,000 neurons. Factor of 10 would require a million neurons. Okay. Um, of course, 
this, I don't want to put too much weight on this particular example. Um, this is one example, and we're busy now evalu calculating this diffusion coefficient, the prefactor of this one over n dependence, to understand how it depends on the other parameters of the network, the, the, the connection weights, the synaptic time constants, and so on. But what I want to take from this example is the conclusion that at least in, in, in this example, the noise coming from the chaotic uh, uh, behavior of the neurons is very important. Okay? And it's not easy to tame it. Okay, so maybe, maybe you're happy with this number, but um, you know, if you estimate, if, if you estimate um, the number of neurons in particular, let's call these micro circuits that are thought to, to be involved in a, in a particular memory, you often have smaller numbers. Okay. A cortical column, this is already large compared to the number of neurons in a cortical column, for example. Okay, so, may, so maybe this is fine. Maybe we're happy with this result. And 10 to the 6 number of neurons is, is, is fine. I think it's a, it's a fairly large number. Okay? And in any case, the conclusion that I want to take from this is that the, the, the noise in networks of, of this size is still very significant. Now remember that, for example, decision-making circuits in the cortex are modeled as two populations that are inhibited, inhibiting each other. If they're noisy dynamic, if, they, if they're also balanced, in a balanced state and they're noisy because of that, this noise, this, this noise might be important. Yes? Okay, this is for a, this is for a given K. This is for a given K. I don't know. Yes? Yes, I'm almost done. Um, so, but what I want, okay, so the, the message I want to make is that the noise, this noise is important even in chaotic, in these chaotic networks. Of course, we want to understand better the dependence on parameters such as K and other parameters. And maybe also there are different network architectures that are more resilient to the noise in the network architecture that I described so far. And this is a question that we're very interested in. And there's lots more to say about this, but I th indeed this is a good time to, to stop. So I just want to, uh, to repeat the, uh, or summarize the main points uh, that I talked about. Um, I've showed you that in continuous attractor networks, which are noisy, noise generates random diffusion uh, within, the, within the attractor. For Poisson neurons, we can calculate this, this, uh, this diffusion, the, the magnitude of this diffusion, and this causes gradual degradation of the memory. Um, noise can also drive systematic drift in these types of networks. Um, there is a deep relationship between this loss of memory due, due to diffusion and coding properties of the neuron in the network. And the, and the reason for this is that the network, in a sense, needs to read its own states from the spikes in order to maintain uh, the memory. And uh, finally, I showed you that this kind of diffusion occurs also in networks in which the, the, noisy the noise comes from chaotic dynamics in a balanced state. And I'll end here. This is because the tuning of the weights, the inhibitory net weight between the two networks is not perfect. If it would be perfectly tuned, this small k would be zero. So, this, so, so if they're perfectly tuned, it's finite n and minus k. You can perfectly tune it to have an abstract. Um, yes, but um, I think so. The, pro the, the problem is that, OK, th there, is, th there is a problem here. And this is part of the reasons it, it's actually difficult to tune it. As soon as you cross the point where k becomes zero, the network actually goes out of the balanced state, as you might expect. OK, but you can come close. But you can come close. There are these uh, other ideas where you think of a random network as an effective default network. And these models don't necessarily evoke the idea of attractor dynamics. That's so That's, that's absolutely true. So for, for one thing, I'm focusing on networks with, with persistent activity because such, brain, such activity is seen in some brain areas. So at least the brain uses that strategy sometimes in order to, 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 maintain, to maintain a memory. Um, in the, these other networks, maybe some of the principles that I talked about at a very high level also apply, but you need to take into account properly the noise and how it, how it affects the dynamics in these systems.
So, so again, I think we should, first of all, we shouldn't, we shouldn't make far-reaching statements about all different forms of memory in the brain. Discussing specifically visual memory, it's a little bit, it's, it's actually quite intriguing. Okay, so in, this, so in these types of experiments, it turns out that actually if you show one, one oriented bar, the memory is excellent, and it also doesn't decay uh, rapidly with time. Things become more complicated and, de and performance degrades a lot when you have several objects. Uh, but I, I also don't think that short -term visual short-term memory is stored in the brain. I think it's, it's very unreasonable to think that the, the brain takes the oriented bar, translates it into a one-dimensional variable, and stores it into a, in, in, a, in a neural network dedicated to store a one-dimensional variable. So the, the, the storage in these, in these situations is almost surely different from this toy model. This depends on the range of variables that you might want to store. So if you really want to store values of the variable which are uniformly distributed, then you would really need to have neurons that have tuning curves that are, that are uniformly distributed. Otherwise, you might not need to do that. Not necessarily, but it might be a continuous. I mean, if you think that this area is is functioning as a short-term memory area, it could be that it that it's that it's doing that, but it's more precise in some orientations than in others. Okay. Um, it's very important because, uh, for example, let's go back to the, 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 the Poisson model. In the Poisson model, uh, there we go. The diffusion coefficient goes like 1 over the tau square. So if you go from, say, AMPA synapses to NMDA synapses, you increase the synaptic time constant by a factor of 10, you win a lot in the stability of the, of the bump. Okay, so, so this... The synaptic time constant sets this, the time scale of the network. I, don't, I, I hope that I answered your question. Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, something about striatum dynamics. There is a very good reason to start for it. We started to think about Parkinson's disease, and there were some oscillations that typically you know, attract many physicists and engineers into the field. And by studying those, somehow we actually, instead of going downstream, in this case, we went upstream to start to think about what striatum can and cannot do. Before I do that, I should thank people with whom I worked on this. So Martin Jyotika, Sebastian, these are the PhD students she just finished. Stefano used to be a postdoc, but now he, ma he moved to industry. And of course, Ed and Stefan have always been good mentors. So this is the, the plan for the evening. It's the last talk, I know. I'll try to keep it short. And uh, let's see how far we go with this. So basal ganglia, that's the, the topic. That's the network we want to study. And uh, this is just for uh, uh, orientation that where is it is located in the brain. But I think that's not relevant for uh, if we want to start to think about it. I think more important is to to think of like how it is organized functionally and anatomically. In this case, this is the anatomical drawing, which is good for physicists or engineers to think about it. So there is cortical input going into striatum, which is a purely inhibitory network. Then there is globus pallidus, which is inhibitory. Globus pallidus internal, that's inhibitory. There's an excitatory connection coming from subthalamic nucleus. So it's a mostly an uh, inhibitory network, except for this one uh, place where there is uh, uh, excitatory input coming in. In addition, all these boxes in, in, in green, they are the main recipient of uh, dopamine. 
when this dopamine disappears, typically you end up with one of the very prominent disease. This is uh, Parkinson's disease, which has typical motor symptoms, a lot of cognitive symptoms, but I think mostly you can recognize it when people have tremor and they are not drinking too, too much coffee. So that would be a, a, a sort of a, a you know, still life picture of a Parkinsonian disease patient. If we look into what happens inside the basal ganglia, then uh, um, one of the first observations that people make is that as soon as dopamine is depleted, these uh, 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 neurons in the subthalamic nucleus at population level, they start to show some oscillatory activity that you can see in the form of increased power in a particular frequency band, which is around 20 hertz or so. In control animals, you don't see it, and this works nice. And, uh, it's not always there, it just waxes and wanes. Not always there, but still it, it persists over a long period of time. Amazing thing about this disease is that its intervention is more or less simple other than the surgical technology that you need. Just stick in a wire in STN, stimulate at high frequency, and lo and behold, these oscillations, they just disappear almost instantaneously. And I think that makes a case that this is a disease which can be really called as a disease of dynamics. Even though it starts with loss of neurons in the, in the SNC and so on, but still really it's a disease of dynamics if you can correct it at the dynamical level. So as long as I can restore the changes, I'm fine. So as I said that this kind of phenomena that attracts a lot of physicists and engineers in the field, and people start to think of models of this disease, how we can understand it. And as I said, that it's a disease of dynamics. So once you start to understand what the dynamical problems are here. But there was earlier some hypothesis for the disease uh, occurrence, particularly for these hypokinetic disorders. Albin already in 1989 hypothesized that striatum is the main cause. But in between, something interesting happened that uh, Plans and Kitai, they showed that actually there is a positive negative feedback loop, which is sufficient to oscillate. They showed it in slices, and then from there on, this practically took off and more or less everybody focuses on this particular pacemaker circuit. As I said, there are models now for this to understand why the circuit oscillates or basically how does it go from its non-oscillatory state to an oscillatory state. Um, one of the idea is that basically these strengths, these strengths they increase and there is a bifurcation in this dynamics when the mutual connectivity strengths, they increase beyond the local recurrent connectivity strength. The mechanism of oscillation then is basically this loop, how, it, how fast it can exchange spiking activity from inhibition to excitation and backwards. Problem with this model is that, uh, first of all, oscillation frequencies, that will turn out to be very, very fast because it's basically a transmission delay between the two networks. Other thing is that it doesn't really say anything about striatum that how come this big structure which is recipient of the most number of dopaminergic uh, uh, projections how come that doesn't play any role and even though there are experimental evidences which i will show in a bit that there are significant changes here second thing is that uh, coupling strength which actually is the main uh, determining factor for these oscillations could be both i mean it's a plastic system uh, frequencies are in the right range. So you could actually say that I have stronger uh, synaptic strength because the system is oscillating and it could be vice versa. So not really a, a convincing model to my mind. There was another su uh, suggestion that instead of looking for an EI loop here, we could look for in this system, look for other kind of EI loops. And indeed, it turns out that if you start to lump in this system, you could find out several EI loops which are much longer and which can actually somehow circumvent this problem that oscillations are still a propagation delay, but over much longer and much bigger system which is lumped together. So the delays are much longer. Problem then is that in such models, most prominently from Leblois, is that GPE has no practical role in that model. And we don't really know then how DBS would work because in many cases you can surgically remove DB, uh, GPE and get rid of these oscillations. So, I think there were significant problems with these models, although they explained quite a lot. Uh, one of the problems, as earlier I was telling you, is that one of the things that these models all missed is the role of striatum. And if we look into striatum, first thing that people noticed is that in a particular animal model now uh, of, of PT, they find out that a certain class of neurons which project onto GPE, they increase their firing rate. Other neurons, they decrease their firing rate. 
So there is some sort of imbalance in the local firing rates in the striatum. And now, more recently, these experiments were done with optogenetics, obviously. And there you can even more conclusively show that if uh, without any chemical uh, injection or anything, without any physical damage to the brain, if you just shine light on, on neurons which project onto GPE, you increase uh, uh, freezing in the animals as opposed to other class of neurons which project to uh, GPI and they express D1 receptor. That is why they are called D1 and others are called D2. If you stimulate D1, you increase mobility in these neurons, uh, in these animals as opposed to the D1, uh, D2 where you decrease the mobility and uh, pr reproduce some other symptoms of PD. So, there is some something going on here that striatum must play a role in, in this system. So, I mean of course, now yet another model of course, what are, what are modelers good for? So, just one more. <laughs> So here we had a, a, an agenda basically to, to say that our model should be able to do few things and one of the prominent one was that we do not want to make any assumption about the synapses. We want to explain the role of striatum and we want to say something beyond oscillations in terms of cognitive deficits maybe. I do not think I will go into all those details, but I will just show you like how striatum actually plays a role here. To start to think about it, uh, it was mainly Stefano who said that why not we think of this uh, system with it is an excitatory inhibitory network. Why do not we think of it as a Lotka Volterra system where now you can think of multiplicative interactions between these two populations. And if you start to write down the, the dynamics as a Lotka Volterra system where you have multiplicative interactions between STN and GPE and same for the external input. If you look at the eigenvalues of the system it is clear that if you drive the system uh, uh, with external input there are conditions when you can create uh, complex eigenvalues which are basically then the, the oscillation uh, in, in these systems. Uh, I will not go into that, but I give you a very simple oscillation rule that comes out of these uh, uh, lotka volterra equations and the rule is following that give a sign to your input whether you are exciting or inhibiting and assign a sign to the recipient population whether this population is excitatory or inhibitory, so plus or minus. Then you start with a baseline state and in this, so plus plus would be exciting the excitation, so obviously it should increase oscillation, it does. If you do plus minus meaning you excite the inhibitory population, oscillations would disappear. If you inhibit the excitation then also they should disappear and I think what is more counterintuitive is that if you inhibit the inhibition then also oscillation should increase because minus minus is plus here. To check this, we put it into now a, a, a numerical simulation where we have 2000 neurons for GPE, 1000 neurons for STN and uh, we tune the parameters to get into physiological ranges. And as soon as we switch on uh, some inhibition of GPE, which is inhibition of inhibition, so it should initiate oscillations and that is what happens almost instantaneously. That if you inhibit the, the inhibition, then you release STN neurons from inhibition, so they become more excitable. Hence there is a, a stronger excitation going into GP and then the cycle just basically continues. So, now we can say that oscillation frequencies they should depend not just on the transmission delays, but how fast these neurons can integrate the incoming activity. So, that should be the determinant of the or dominant frequency should be determined by these. Uh, second thing is that now we really know that how come striatum is actually uh, uh, playing a role in, in, in creating these oscillations. Uh, our model all also suggests that if you want to get rid of these oscillation then deep brain stimulation what I do not know how it would it should do it, but it should actually be inhibitory because you are stimulating a positive or excitatory network. At least in models it works exactly like this. So, we inject some inhibition in STN and because this guy was uh, receiving less inhibition from GPE now it is back into its original state. So, oscillations disappear however, there is a big difference now that the starting point was somewhere around 40 plus hertz, but afterwards after oscillations have gone because of this intervention firing rates are still around I do not know 28 or so uh, 22 or so. Reason is that we did not do anything here this inhibition is still going here. So, GPE is still in a depressed state in a more inhibited state. So, I do not think this is a complete answer, but at least it could nicely explain how you can get rid of these oscillations, how you can create these oscillations. The suggestion that DBS should be inhibitory, I really do not know how it should be implemented. So, when I was hearing Ifat's talk, 
there I noticed that she was when she was stimulating then those uh, axons were not really following the stimulation frequency. So, I think that could be one way that these axons are not really then transmitting the stimulation um, the, the spikes and that is why you get effective inhibition. Also there is some data from Izar Bargad's lab which also indicates in the right direction. So, just to summarize this. I think there is a very simple model here that uh, striatum inhibition is the main uh, uh, player in this game and it can create oscillation. One can also understand like how in a healthy state this particular inhibitory network which to my mind I think is the only inhibitory circuit in the brain which has such low firing rate. If you go to cerebellum or globus pallidus or anywhere else I think in general inhibitory circuits have much higher firing rates than striatum. These neurons fire typically at 1 hertz or less. We could also uh, explain some things about the, the, the behavior, but I won't go in there, but I think the main message here was that the striatum is the problem. So, we really wanted to know what goes on in the, in the striatum. So, if we look into the striatum, it turns out that it is a much more interesting circuit there. Initially, people believed that it is just a, a collection of uh, inhibitory neurons sparsely collected, recurrent inhibition is very, very weak most of it what is there is just like cortical input coming in some feed forward inhibition keeps it in the balance and that is it it is a relay. Of course, there are then dopamine uh, uh, inputs which basically enhance the cortico striatal connection strength and that is how you learn and uh, uh, form your preferences and so on. But it turns out that these D 1 and D 2 neurons which respectively project onto G P I and uh, to G P E they are in a connected in a much more interesting manner and question. So, I will give you numbers in few minutes. So, the question would be that if you have two independent more or less independent populations, uh, how come they are interacting and in what condition these D 2 neurons they can enhance their firing rates. So, that eventually you get a symptom something like uh, PD related oscillations. So, the numbers that came out that showed something interesting, which is that first of all feed forward inhibition is not uniformly distributed there is more feed forward inhibition onto D 2 neurons than on D 1 neurons. As far as the recurrent connectivity goes D 2 D 2 connections are much more and stronger D 1 D 1 connections are fewer and sparser uh, weaker. So, that is about the recurrence within the population. I think most interesting and relevant here is that D 2 neurons they project more strongly to D 1 neurons. So, there is some sort of asymmetry between these two populations and I think that is why they should be studied separately as two dif different populations. So, if D 1 receives more inhibition that means, it should also receive more excitation to get going at least in models. If you want to start this network to function and you want D 1 neurons to have any say in the dynamics then you better inject some more excitation into these. This excitation could be added to the uh, uh, neurons either in the form of stronger synapses. So, you could imagine that cortical synapses to D 1 neurons are stronger than D 2 neurons that would, would be one possibility. Other possibility would be that these two neurons the two kind of neurons they receive different amount of excitation. There are some hints in literature like whether their dendritic arbor is bigger or smaller or they are excitable or not and so on. So, but nothing is really conclusive. So, for us I mean as modelers I think the, the option was that we could systematically study what happens to this dynamics as you change either the connection weights or the input rates. What I will show you is effect of input rates actually because I think that is more interesting. Um, so, you inject some firing rate or sorry I think this is for a slightly different weight and now constant rate goes into the two neurons. So, if you look at this would be the input to D 1 and this would be input to D 2 and as a color what, I, what is plotted is the difference between D 1 and D 2 firing rate. So, just to check the balance between the two. Um, the cyan colors are about 0, so no difference and clearly these dark colors they have no relevance because differences of 40 hertz are just not possible. Similarly, differences of minus 24 are not relevant actually. So, what is interesting is a range between where you can get plus minus 5 to 10 hertz. So, if you go along each diagonal then this diagonal would refer to a state where both neurons both type of neurons they get constant and common input because D 1 and D 2 rates are same 
if you go off diagonal, you shift it, then this would imply that there is a slightly bias towards the input to d 1 as opposed to d 2. And if you now take all the differences here, and you render it as a function of the difference of the drive to the two populations, then of course, because this is d 2 is inhibiting d 1 more, then all the differences are negative, when there is slight bias. So, along the diagonal for instance, but as you shift the, di the diagonal, then you start to get positive and negative differences, meaning as you will go from here to here, initially you will have positive difference and then it will become negative and eventually in a very high input range, it is all negative, uh, all positive. So, d 1 wins, but that is really not relevant. As I said that most interesting states would be somewhere here, where even for behavior, what you want is that these two populations, they can change their relative firing rates because these two new, uh, neuron populations, they project onto the so called go and no go pathways. So, you really want to, if you want to facilitate an action, you want d 1 to, to send more output to downstream structures, otherwise d 2. So, I would say that this is the range where uh, the system should operate and we tried really hard. I mean, you could say that these differences are not really very big, uh, 2 to 5 hertz or so in, in relevant parameter range. But if the system is operating at such low firing rate, I think this difference is rel relatively speaking is quite high. So, if I now plot you uh, an input to, to D 1 and D 2 neurons, imagine that there is a constant drive with slight bias, meaning I am just taking out a, a line from one of the diagonal from this picture here. So, what you see is there is initially D 1 firing rate higher than D 2 firing rate uh, takes over. And this would be a crossover point where you would say that you know I flip between d1 and d2. You can now calculate it how it depends on the feed forward inhibition because that goes more to d1 than to d2. So as feed forward inhibition rate will increase, this difference will become negative. Um, because this was somehow related to the low dopamine, high dopamine state. Question was that how do you model dopamine and how can what can you comment about d1, d2 balance? Um, dopamine is a mess, nobody really knows what it does, but there are some general consensus on, on, on the function and that general consensus is that uh, dopamine actually increases the strength of inputs to D 1 neurons and it decreases the strength of inputs to D 2 and something similar happens on the neuronal excitability level. So, one could think that overall on average that what dopamine would do is if there is more dopamine, then these connections will be stronger than these ones. And if there is less dopamine, then these connections are stronger than these ones. So, if we mimic that situation here and now look for the balance between d 1 and d 2 and more important would be to look at the crossover point between these two, because that is the time when d 2 starts to, to drive the system downstream. Then if you are here, that would be let us say normal and if you increase more dopamine in the system, that means d 1 neurons will fire higher at higher rate. So, it will take more input to, to counter that uh, excitability. So, this shift uh, the, the, the crossover point will move uh, towards higher inputs and if you have less dopamine, then this crossover point moves downwards. So, what happens then if, if dopamine is gone? First thing is that you have more activity on this d 2 neurons, which are supposedly the no go pathway activation. That means, if dopamine is gone immediately, you are sort of by default you are this th because this threshold goes down, you are sort of in a in a jammed situation. So, you are really not facilitating actions. Other thing would be that because these neurons will have now stronger influence downstream. So, they can also initiate those uh, uh, oscillations that we earlier saw, but this is just about rates. We all know that uh, rate is just one aspect of the activity. If you look at the second order statistics, we will be thinking about correlations. So, next step was to, to think of correlations, how they are actually affecting this balance. Um, to inject correlations, we, we started to think about uh, uh, a particular scenario where or, or a scenario which gives you more control over how you inject correlations in the system. And the idea is that imagine there is a, I mean if you, if you start to think about it, take two neurons and you will say that they have their own presynaptic pools, you could have correlation among those neurons which are presynaptic to one neuron. So, within each cloud. So, there is a, a number for each uh, cloud, but in addition you can define how correlated these clouds are. So, if you wish you can think of it as uh, 
the correlation which I call W or within correlation that is sort of the convergence of the input and B which is the correlation between the presynaptic pools of the neurons that is sort of the divergence of the input. So, in a way this is a way to quantify the convergence and divergence of the corticostriatal projections. So, that means I have to now think of how these W and B correlations they are going to affect the balance of the activity. So, if we start here again now pick up one firing rate. Uh, something where D 1 was winning or D 2 was winning and then change W and B. By the way by definition of these two it is uh, a given that B cannot be larger than W. So, that is why you will only see this lower triangle here. Now, if I change this correlation it turns out that the difference actually gets stronger at some weak correlation and if you increase it further when input becomes too correlated then basically there is no way to differentiate between the two. Uh, also, I am assuming that both populations they get basically same amount of correlations and as you change B which would be now along these uh, curved lines then of course, there is an effect, but at low correlations within a pool B actually enhances this difference. So, this sort of improves the signal to noise ratio if you wish or the contrast between D 1 and D 2. If you are at this max W max then it actually decreases it and same thing happens at a higher firing rate basically everything gets shifted. So, here would be a situation where let us say D, uh, D 1 is has lesser firing rate, but if you increase more correlation you can to some extent increase the firing rate of D 1 beyond D 2. So, that means there is a dual play now that uh, uh, rates as well as correlation both are important and they together define what would be the output of stridum whether D 1 will have a higher rate or D 2 will have a higher rate. So, if I try to summarize this, so let us say this is input correlation and that is the input firing rate assuming that both now cortex does not know whether it is to prefer D 1 or D 2 uh, both in terms of correlations or firing rates. So, it basically floods the, the, the stridum with its own activity and now stridum has to decide whether D 1 should be activated or D 2 should be activated and now because there is asymmetric connectivity that is connections from D 2 to D 1 are much more and uh, way too strong that gives you this sort of a threshold function if you wish that at low correlation low firing rate because you slightly bias it D 1 has higher firing rate, but if you increase it then D 2 gets to uh, send more output and other way around, but you can change it for, for uh, if you increase the correlation. So, that means there is this, this little ellipse here where D 1 will have a higher firing rate than D 2 and in this uh, corner D 2 will have higher firing rate. The way I think this works now is that I think one could say this that the stridum given this kind of connectivity is more or less acting like a, uh, a detector for the statistics of the cortical activity given that it has D 1 or D 2. So, this is assuming that there is no preference from cortex. One could say that yes cortex will have preference after you have made some reinforcements and so on that maybe you have learned to avoid something. So, maybe connections to D 1 are stronger than D 2 and so on, but that would be a situation where you start out like this, but let us say if you start out like this and you basically raise the level of cortical activity then striatum acts like if it is low then let us say D 1, if it is high then let us say it is D 2. So, to me it is a very simple description of what striatum could be doing as, as a network just because it has this kind of connectivity. How is with the time now? Perfect. So, this was about a, a general scheme that you assume uh, uh, striatums even though differentiated between D 1 and D 2, but still considering that as a recurrent network without any space. Uh, question would be that if we can go beyond this because this is just a, a rate dynamics average behavior and people always claim that stridum has a much more interested arrangement of inputs at least from cortex there are this uh, fractured representation of cortical areas and so on. So, question was to think of the spatial structure of the activity. There was another reason to believe in uh, to, to ask this question that people had started to talk about uh, um, neural assemblies in the in the striatal networks. Neural assemblies in the sense that if you look at let us say slices of cortical uh, striatal uh, uh, networks then you would find out that there are certain neurons which become co-activated and they follow certain kind of sequences. So, some sort of repeat of cortical songs if you wish if you, uh, I am sure you are familiar with that and there was the suggestion that 
activity actually goes from one state to another and so on in a, in a specific manner. And if you change the dopamine uh, levels in this network, then first of all number of assemblies that, that gets reduced and second the sequences become more and more repetitive. There was a modeling suggestion that how such a kind of assemblies may arise which was to basically uh, assume it to be a homogeneous uh, recurrent network of inhibitory neurons and see whatever neurons become active and then cluster them. This is post hoc once you have all the activity and indeed they could show that it, these neurons distributed widely across the space, they become coactive for a certain uh, uh, duration which is, I think there is a catch here, but still they could show that it stays and they, they propose that because it is a mutually inhibitory network, there can be small little assemblies which inhibit each other and also inhibit others. So, one of them becomes active, then it stops the firing of other such assemblies, but because there is mutual inhibition within the assembly, it also falls apart after some time. So, the kind of notion of a winnerless competition if you wish. So, first of all we could not reproduce this, this uh, results in random networks, so that was one frustration, but also around that time new data started to come about the, the spatial extent of connectivity within the striatum. Uh, it is very interesting uh, uh, if you look at it that this is now a functional connectivity data. So, they, they look at the code, uh, striatal GPE sli uh, uh, slices and stimulate the axons, look at how many neurons are inhibiting each other and then block the inhibition and see who gets released from inhibition and how far in space. So, there is some sort of a alpha function, gamma function kind of behavior here who gets released from inhibition. There was in parallel another study where they tried to do a potential connectivity mapping. Uh, this is again not, uh, I mean you basically take a neuron and try to overlap uh, uh, axon on the dendrites and see how many cross sections you get at what distance and they also suggest that here it should be number of connections that should be something like a, a alpha function or a gamma function weekly. Meaning it is not a standard connectivity that we are used to for neocortical networks where we think that the connectivity is more or less Gaussian distributed to, to the first approximation as the distance grows. So, question was whether this kind of connectivity can give us something, something more uh, uh, about these assemblies. So, we started first with the simulations. So, you start with the simulation of 20,000 leak integrate fire neurons, consider weak connections, average connectivity of 10 percent or so and see what comes out. In our naivety first when we did not know this uh, connectivity data, we started with the uh, uh, Gaussian connectivity profile something like here. And if you simulate the dynamics of now D1 and D2 neurons, practically you will see no structure here. It's, it's basically a nice AI state. And there's no reason why there should be more correlations here because there is nothing excitatory in the recurrent circuit. Even if you give it some extra input, you still don't see any kind of structure really emerging in this. But if we now change to a different connectivity kernel, so this is now in two dimensions. So uh, wherever you have uh, brighter color, that is where you make connections with higher probability. So, some sort of a donut around a neuron. And it turns out in such networks, if you simulate this dynamics, that for lo very low inputs, you do not see much. But if you have, uh, let us say, slightly uh, uh, moderate uh, amount of input, then you start to see that there are these local uh, in, uh, um, neurons. By the way, these are not arranged in space. We just took all the neurons. Neurons, I think, from here to here are one row and second row and so on. But nevertheless, they are more or less spatial neighbors. So you do see some sort of attractor behavior, if you wish, that local neurons, they, they become active, they suppress activity of their neighbors, and then at some point they, they lose it. But, and if you stimulate it at a higher input rate, then these clusters, they basically are persistent. So this kind of suggests that with the, uh, this gamma function type of connectivity, you have multiple bump states in these networks. I can show you a, a, a little movie of how it looks like. So, this would be a case where you have unstable uh, bumps that become active, so only one population uh, and uh, yeah, it is color coded basically how many neurons are active at a given point. But if you uh, inject stronger input, then these 
bumps are more or less stable. Perhaps we can now ask Yoram how unstable they are and how, how they diffuse. So. So what we are seeing is some sort of this winnerless competition in the, in the weak input regime where you have one cluster active for some time and then goes out. So this would be like something like that these uh, states are sitting in a, so it's not an attractor technically, it's a saddle which is stable in some dimension and unstable in some other dimension, so it can just uh, slide away. So why does it work and uh, how come we need uh, a sort of uh, um, this, this gamma function type of connectivity and why gamma, uh, the Gaussian connectivity does not work. So to answer this question, we started to think of like these neural field models where you can analyze the dynamics in space by connecting in this, the, the, the kernel here. So we use different kind of gamma functions here defined by their scale and the uh, um, sh mm, shape parameters. So for instance, some of this, those shapes are shown here. And then you can plug those in and count how many clusters you, or how many bumps you will have, how stable those bumps will be, uh, what is the lifetime if they are not stable and so on. So I won't show you all those because for the discussion here, I think more important is to find out how many bumps are there. Um, as you change theta or k parameter of the gamma function, then you, re you find out that actually by increasing theta or, uh, or k together, you get these nice contour lines which tell you how many bumps will be possible there. And this pretty much very well, ma okay, it doesn't completely match, but it basically agrees with it that as you change theta or k, you can increase number of bumps in the system. So why these number of bumps are, are relevant? Actually more bumps, meaning more such assemblies you can form, more competition you can create. That means it's a, it's a richer dynamics as opposed to a state where either you have no bump or one bump which is stable for, for life. So, I'll give you just some numbers now for numerical simulations for D1 and D2 populations, where we change the, the average input rate and count number of bumps. And this sort of changes in a sigmoid fashion, so it gives a, an idea that there's a, a weak input regime where stridum is highly, highly sensitive, where it can uh, very rapidly and in a high gain way interact or react to the, to, to the inputs. Um, if you ask how many neurons per cluster, that also progressively increases as you give in more input. So this would be the, let's say, strength of these clusters. Uh, and if you count how much of total network gets recruited in this, there is some sort of non-monotonicity here that at weak inputs, you have many more neurons participating in it as opposed to strong inputs because here, whoever gets active, he gets to live forever as long as you simulate this dynamic. So, Basically, this would be the state where you want to be because that's where you have the maximal dynamic range for, for stridal network. Also, what is interesting is that if no, we count the, the lifetime of these clusters, then for low input somewhere here, you have more or less nothing. And at high input somewhere here, you have mo most of these clusters, they live as long as the simulation lives. In between, in this so-called high sensitivity regime, you get a much wider distribution. It has to be, of course, filled. More simulations have to be done and so on. But it kind of gives an idea that uh, uh, the dynamics evolves in such a way that at this weak input or uh, moderate input regime, you have much more flexibility in the dynamics. So one could now argue that uh, because of change in the dopamine levels, because of the change in the overall balance in D1 and D2, what perhaps could be happening is that Initially, in healthy state, you are here, and you are pushed towards this particular state where you have few clusters, very strong clusters, so you can't really change your, your you can't really voluntarily decide what to do because you can't really break these. Um, and here, since you have such high sensitivity and high dynamic range, you have always more chances to make new combinations and so on, as opposed to uh, uh, the strong input regime where practically nothing can be done. I mean, whatever you have it, you have it. So just to summarize this now, so I started with uh, a motivation to, to understand Parkinson's disease from the, the perspective of the oscillations. 
and uh, our answer took us upstream into the striatum. And if we look into the striatum, then it turns out that there are interesting interactions possible between the two populations within the striatum. And I think what I really like is that maybe there is a simple way to describe now striatum function in the sense that it sort of acts like a detector for the cortical activity statistics just because it has these two populations interacting in an asymmetric manner. And finally, if you look at the activity in, in space for D1 and D2 neurons, it turns out that again you better be working with a, a, a moderate input regime, meaning even local activity should be in that same uh, weak regime, where you have high sensitivity, you can man, make many new clusters which have variable lifetime, so you have what, much richer dynamics as opposed to be in so called winner take all competition where somebody gets active and then stays active forever which cannot be disturbed. So, that perhaps would be more likely to be a, a PD state as opposed to healthy state where you have much more uh, uh, interesting dynamics. So, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. I was wondering how this can have an addition in the extra with the uh, much higher sensitivity of the input field, you know. Um, so what is the impact of this um, property on this balance between D1 and D2? I don't know this answer. Um, more because I don't know what exactly uh, dopamine is going to do to D2. Um, I mean, we are now starting to think about it, uh, how to deal with dopamine. And honestly speaking, in these uh, spatial arrangements, so right now, because there is no real data about D1 to D2 connectivity or D2 to D1 in space, so we have to live with this assumption that uh, you know it's the same uh, gamma function type connectivity. And in that case, it turns out that all these bump states they are actually symmetrical. Yeah. So whatever you see in the D1 population, you will see in the other population as well. So that doesn't really help in, in making any decision. So this is sort of like, uh, you know, you are basically in a stalemate situation. So, I really don't know what to do with that right now, but maybe we'll have some answers. 